was in Ephesus. Uh, and the people, when they desired him to tarry a longer time with them, he consented not. Paul the preacher is at Ephesus. Remember he was at, uh, um, or was he for almost a year and a half, uh, 18 months? They were with the uh, all the idols and everything. All right, so now he's leaving. 18 months have passed. And so he is leaving because he wants to go to the synagogue. And he wants to talk to the Jews. You know why he wants to talk to the Jews? He's a Jew. He wants his own people to get saved. He wants his, his uh, cousins and all the rest of his family members to know about Jesus Christ. Please put that up. And, um, and he wants them to get saved. When they desired him to tarry longer with them, he consented not, but bade them farewell, saying, I by all must means keep the feast that cometh to Jerusalem. So where does he want to go? Jerusalem. Why? The feast in Jerusalem, all right, was the biggest feast they had once a year. Everybody went, all right, and so he wants to be there, even though he's a Christian. So far, we have not divided Christianity from Judaism. Uh, and sometimes they preach Christianity in the, in the synagogue. Sometimes they would preach Judaism in, in the synagogue. It just depends on who was the high priest at the time. All right? So, depending on which church you went to, which synagogue you went to, it depends on what message you heard. Uh, everywhere Paul went, he preached Christ. So he wants to go back and try to persuade more people, more of his own people, to get saved. Now, that doesn't mean it's a bad thing that he's going around saving people that are non-Christians. I mean, non-Jews like us. We are Gentile dogs. So it's a good thing, all right, that he's doing what he's doing. But that's not what God wants him to do. He said, but I'm going to come back. I'm going to come back to Ephesus. And when he landed at uh, Caesarea and gone up, saluted the church, he went down to Antioch. And after he spent some time there, he departed, went over the country of Galatia, Persia, in order, strengthening all the disciples. So he's doing the, the, the traveling of an evangelist. Most wives cannot handle an evangelist. It takes a very special woman for the man to leave all the time and to come home and stay for a couple of weeks and then get back on the road and not see them for a couple of weeks. It takes a special family, children, all right, uh, you know. So not that many men are called to evangelism. A lot are called missionaries because they're going to stay in one place. A lot of men are called to be pastors because they're going to stay in one place. But evangelists, the people that actually say they're evangelists now, are not. Uh, an evangelist goes to a church and uplifts the church. The problem is now is it's all about money. For an evangelist to make it today, he has to preach Sunday morning at one church, Sunday night at another church, Wednesday night at another church. He hopefully he makes a camp meeting Monday and Tuesday at one other church, and another camp meeting Thursday and Friday at another church, and then start all over again the week after. All right, and so he's got to be at one, two, three, four, five churches if he's lucky. Uh, and that's every week. That's 250 churches a week. Why? Because he's got to make money. It costs a lot of money to put up an evangelist. You got to go to meeting and meeting and meeting and meeting and meeting and meeting because guess what? When you're an evangelist, 
There's no preacher there paying to pay for your hotel room. There's no preacher there paying for your food. You have to do it yourself. And if you don't have a church that's big enough to support you, you got to go to a lot of churches. Paul is not doing it for the money. Why? Everybody knows. What does he do for a living? He's a tent maker. Oh, yeah. That's right. That's so what does he do? To make money and to support his ministry, he makes tents. He does not have others support him. He makes tents. All right? And so we have our church here. I work. I've been working all my life. Uh, so far, thank God, I've never been on uh, as far as uh, unemployment. Not one day. And the reason is, I don't, I don't think that a man ought to be under an un unemployment. You will never see, this is the one thing I like about Muslims and Hindus, or at least the Hindus, you will never see a Hindu or a Muslim with the sign, you know, will work for money or need a job. You never see these guys out there. White people, yes. Black people, yes. Mexican people, yes. Muslims, Hindus, you know why? They've been taught their whole life, be a man. Work. Support your family. I don't care if you got to have five jobs. You support your family. You will never, 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 never see a Muslim or a Hindu out there. Now, they're getting lazy because they're in America now. So I see a few once in a while. They're called gypsies. You'll see, you know what a gypsy is? A gypsy's on the side of the road begging for money, him and his wife. You know, the kids, they got the kids there. They're going, can you please help us? No, 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 but if you get in the car, i get you a job. Well, you can come work for me right now. Oh, I don't want a job. I want money. That's a gypsy. He don't want no money. I mean, he don't want no, no hamburger. He, he wants you to give him cash. I want cash, man. You, got, you ain't got no cash? I don't want to talk to you. That's what a gypsy is. Paul is what? A tent maker. So why can he do this? Because he's paying his own way. Do you understand that? I go to little bitty churches. I fly. Cost me five, you know, three hundred dollars to fly. Then I gotta rent a car. I gotta rent a car to drive to wherever I'm going. Another two hundred dollars if they can't pick me up. Alright, so now I'm up to five hundred. If it's a good church, I'll give them an offering. I'll give them another three hundred. Now it's eight hundred dollars, and then they write me a whole check for two hundred dollars, maybe three if I'm good. So I've lost how much? Six, seven hundred dollars, something like that. Five hundred dollars. Why? Because it want to be a blessing. It's not about the money. If you're going to be in the ministry for the money, you're in it for the wrong reason. You do it because you love God. That's the only reason. So, Paul is now traveling some more. He met a Jew named Apollos. Now, Apollos is an eloquent man. Do you know what an eloquent man? By the way, that's not me. An eloquent man is a diplomat. He wears a suit. I wear a suit. You know, I, I, you know, I, I can look you know, professional, I, you know, put my rings on, I can look, you know, high class, I forgot my watch, I, you know, so, uh, you know, I can look high class, but he can talk to people and not yell and scream, and he's very persuasive, people like him. You ever met a person like that? He's very charismatic, a brother, uh, Carl uh, Wright. He's a greeter. As soon as you meet him, he's your best friend. As soon as you meet this guy, 
I mean, he thinks, he says, you know what, man, you know, boy, I sure appreciate you coming to church today. How's your life going? How's things going over there? I mean, he really cares. And, and I wish I was more like him. I really do. You know, but me, I look at Jeremy and I go, eh. And so, I mean, that's about all I get. I mean, you know, he knows I love him. But, I mean, that, that's about as eloquent as I get, all right? It's nothing personal. It's just not me. But Apollos is. But Apollos is preaching the baptism of John. He got baptized by the first Baptist, John the Baptist. You know what he's preaching? You got to get baptized and Messiah's coming. You know why? That's all he knows. He's only heard one message. You got to get baptized and get ready because the Messiah's coming. So you know what Apollos does? He gets up and preaches the same message. There was a famous evangelist. He had ten messages. After he preached the ten messages, he went home to his mom. He told his mom, I don't preach the ten messages in every church I've been to. And they've all invited me to come back and, and preach again. She said, what should I do? She said, go back and preach the ten messages again. She said, and if God don't give you any more, keep preaching the same ten. See, some people think you got to have something new all the time. Something fantastic, you know. And, 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 and we always try to do something around here, you know, like last week we had our Thanksgiving uh, dinner. We had a bunch of people show up. Everybody ate. Everybody had a good time. You know, so we, we enjoyed that, right? You got to mix it around a little bit. But, but Apollos, he don't know nothing. Just the only message he knows is you got to be baptized because the Messiah is coming. Repent of your sin. And so Paul brought him over and said, guess what? The Messiah didn't came. His name is Jesus Christ. The Messiah didn't die. The Messiah is already risen. And you know what Apollos did? He got saved. Because the preacher took him. A preacher didn't come to him and say and told him something like, oh, you dummy, I can't believe that, you know, that's the only message you know is, is this old message and you don't know anything else. Listen, you read your Bible, we're all going to learn it different. I knew this one guy, he, would, he knew that Bible. I mean, he knew every verse. He could tell you. History, he could tell you Greek, he could tell you everything in the world except for one thing. He did not know God. He did not know the Holy Ghost. He did not know that God could come inside and speak to you. See, all he had was here. Does that make sense? That's all he had. It was in his mind. It was not in his heart. When it gets deep down in your heart, that's when things change. So Paul started using Apollos. And Apollos, he spoke boldly. And, and, and uh, Aquila would go with him and Priscilla. They heard about him. And, and they brought him along. And they showed him. And he mightily convinced the Jews and, and that publicly showing by the scripture that Jesus was Christ. You know what was Apollos' what job was? He could actually make you sit down and then he would say, listen, take your Bible and I'm going to show you the scripture. And then you would look at it and he said, now, now what is that talking about? Is that talking about Jesus or not? And he'd start from the book of Genesis and he'd go all the way back to the book of Malachi because that's all they had. And he would explain to them that that was Jesus Christ. Time after time after time after time. He was a gifted man. And he wouldn't make you feel like you were dumb. You ever, you ever had somebody like that make you feel like you're dumb? I had a guy one time, an uh, old preacher, 
preacher was there, and he was asking questions. And they were all in the room, all the preachers were in the room, and he believed in Calvinism. Calvinism basically says, when you get born, you either go to hell or you go to heaven. No choice. All right? But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, whosoever should call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You have a choice. But, you know, Calvinism says, no, there is no choice. You either go to heaven or you go to hell. doesn't really matter. You, you can't choose. But that's not what the book says. So this old preacher's there, and this guy believes in Calvinism because he's been going to that church. And he talks to the old man, and he says, now, can you explain to me about Calvin? And some, some other young man that was there said, do you believe in that? Oh, man, you're just a dummy. Anybody that believes in that is just plain stupid. And that young man quit asking questions. He didn't want to be ridiculed. He didn't want to be made fun of. He didn't want anybody else to think that he didn't know what he, what he was uh, doing. And the one man, Jack Wood, that could help him, he didn't want to ask him any more questions. And Paulus was that kind of man that he would answer you privately so that nobody's around, nobody thinks you're dumb, nobody thinks... Does that make sense? Where, where, where you actually see the scripture and he shows you the scripture and you go, I ain't never seen it like that. Wow. Isn't that great? And Apollos was that way. They took him to the side they showed him how Jesus had died, how Jesus had risen, how Jesus had been seen, how Jesus was now on the, on the right hand of the Father. And he believed. And he, guess what? Now he's preaching. He ain't preaching John the Baptist. Now he's preaching Jesus Christ. You need Jesus Christ as your Savior. So they came to Corinth. And Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. And he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Are they believers? Let's read the scripture again. He said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. Ghost. So they're believers, but guess what? They never got it inside. They believe in God, they believe in Jesus Christ, but they've never experienced the total power of the Holy Ghost. I hate to say this, most Christians have never felt that power. You ever get that power? We go to camp meetings. The reason we go to camp meetings is that's usually when the power gets turned on. And you can feel it, but you don't really need it. You can be in your house and have a piece of the Holy Ghost. And he said, do you have it? And they said, uh, we ain't even heard of such a thing. He said, then, then what were you baptized? They said, in the John's baptism. Then said Paul, uh, and then John, verily baptized with baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him, which should come after him, that is Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. Now, tongues doesn't mean garbage. You know, uh, you know, I sell my Honda, sell my Honda, sell my Honda, sell my Honda, sell my Honda. You know, I want to sell my Honda. No, no, no. They weren't trying to sell their Honda, okay? Uh, he, they were speaking in tongues. People around them, they were speaking different languages. People that were Greek that were there, guess what? They heard them speaking Greek. People that were uh, uh, Hispanic, they heard them speaking Spanish. 
people that were Asian, they heard them speak in, in, Chi in uh, Chinese. They were all kind, and they prophesied. You know what prophesied means? Tell the future. They foretold the future. And they had Paul, after they got baptized, laid his hands on him, and guess what? It was an experience that they never had. I remember the story of uh, Preacher Dan. Preacher Dan said the same thing. He said he kept going to church, kept going to church, kept getting on the altar, and, and finally... And uh, he went from one church to the other church, and he finally told him, I said, you need to go to Jack Wood's church. When he went to Jack Wood's church, he said, I'll tell you what you need. He said, uh, he said, yeah, you just need to come listen to the preacher. And every week he'd come down there every Sunday, and he'd get on the ground, he'd get on his knees. And you know what God did? He looked down, and he said, I really think this man wants to be different. You want to be different? Do you want the Holy Ghost? Do you really want to touch a God? Or are you satisfied with the Christianity that you hope will get you to heaven? Because most Baptists, unfortunately, don't go to heaven. They just think they are. They experienced it. And Preacher Dan got up and he looked looked up, he saw Brother Jack's boots and Brother Jack said, what do you want boy? He said, I just want to know God more. Oh, that's, children, that's my desire for you this morning is for you to know God more. That everybody in here would say, that's what I want. Jack put his hands on Preacher Dan while he was on his knees. He said, God, I've been watching this young man for a year and a half. He said, this young man really wants to know you. He said, would you give him the desires of his heart? He wasn't asking for money. He wasn't asking for a bigger house or a new car. He just wanted to know God. And Brother Jack started praying for him. He said when he took his hands off him, Preacher Dan's testimony was there was a fire that came inside my heart. He said it burned. He said I men that can greet people like Brother Carl, Miss Sides, there are ladies that, that can do that. Fire, deep down, these men were believers. I, I bet you in here, if I ask right now, do you believe in God? I believe everybody in here would say yes. Even Seth. I believe even Seth would say, yeah, I, 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 I believe in God. But do you know him? Has he ever put his hand on you and touched you? He ever puts his hand on you?
told God one time, I said, I was laying down as a young man, and Seth was a little boy. He's probably a couple months old. And uh, I told God, I said, whatever it takes, I'm willing to pay the price. Put me through the fire. Do whatever you want to do to me. Outside and die. It was just your time to die. You ain't in control. You think you're in control, but you're not in control. All the ones in control is God. But I asked. And I remember the devil coming. And he showed up. I'm praying to God. And the devil showed up. He said, if you turn your life all the way to God, I jumped up, popped up, ran over that baby crib, put my hand on the sun, and he was still breathing. I told God, I said, Lord, if you'll let him live, I'll do the best job I can. I ain't done the best. I, I wish I could say, I wish I could say that I've done everything right. But he let him live. And I remember that time and that experience. If a man's going to give his life and a young man's going to give his life, it's going to cost you. Gonna, I'm not talking about money. It's going to cost you. Are you willing to sell out? Paulus was. He sold. They got filled with the Holy Ghost. And all the men, about 12, and they went to the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months. Three months they're in church, going back and forth to church. Disputing, persuading, concerning the kingdom of God. But when divers were hardened and believed not, but speak evil of the way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. The first time you hear about a school is this. You know why we record these messages? I'm teaching on the book of Acts. Every chapter is outlined. So that a young man can go back and listen to every video and learn everything verse by verse about the book of Acts. It's just not for you. It's for others. But they can go back and learn. The school was started I went to school. I went to school and I sat down and I learned. It wasn't Sunday morning, it wasn't Sunday night, it wasn't Thursday night, it was Monday night, Tuesday night. And I had two preachers. That was four more hours of study. And I did that. You know why? I wanted to know that Bible. I wanted to know God. And even though sometimes it was boring, I mean, it's just plain boring. Some of these guys were boring. I sat through it. You know why I sat through it? Because I said, sooner or later, God's going to help me. God's going to give me something. I may, I may have to pay the price of boredom. <laughs> I may have to pay the price of just sitting here and, and just listening to this guy, 
bore that bore. I mean, it's it, it'd be more exciting watching paint dry. I mean, I mean, this, that's how exciting some of them guys were. But they learned, and they continued for two years. And I guess what this school did. And they continued by the space of two years so that all that which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. What did God, uh, if you weren't here before, God told Paul, do not go to Asia. You know why, Paul, why God told Paul to do that? Because God said, you old man. You're already getting too old. You got the arthritis in your leg. You can't even climb up the stairs anymore. You have a hard time. He said, let's get some young guys in here. Some young men. How old are you, boy? Eleven. How old are you? Twelve. There's strength right there. How old are you, boy, Jeremy? Seventeen. Seth? Seventeen. You know what guys are looking for? They went everywhere. They knocked on every door and the whole country of Asia because of the school, the old man teaching for two years. And I mean, when he taught, he got up in the morning, he started at 9 o'clock, he ended the school at 5 o'clock, and he taught one thing, how to become a preacher, how to become a preacher. How to learn to make tents. How to learn how to survive and make money on your own so you don't need anybody else to teach you how to make money. He taught them how to make money. He taught them how to door knock. He taught them how to tell them about Jesus. He taught, and guess what? The whole country out of this one school That's a lot of people, man. That's a lot of people when, when you can say, we, we told everybody. We told everybody. Two years. You know why? He had young men that were filled with the Holy Ghost, filled with the fire, filled with wanting to do something for God. You want to do something for God? It takes young men that are filled with that fire takes young men. Hopefully in January, we're going to start handing out flyers. We're going to start passing out flyers and right after your Shady Acres camp meeting. We're going to start going out there door knocking. And it's going to take young men because I'm too old. I can drive the van. That's about it. I can drive the spur. That's about it. You know. But it's going to take young men. And we're going to have to get after it. That's the only way. If we're going to Get everybody humbled here. They did a whole country. At least we can do one city. You figure we can do at least one city. And they continued two years, and God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. You know what God did? He looked at Paul and said, Tell you what I'm going to do. Since you love me so much, you did so many things in the past you weren't supposed to. I'm going I'm to let you do special miracles. And so that from his body he brought forth unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons and diseases departed from them and evil spirits went out of them. You know what that means? Paul, again, was a what? Tent maker. You know what a tent maker has? He's like a butcher. He has to have an apron on. So he can wipe his hands on the apron. Because he get greasy and get dirty. So somebody that wanted to come in there and say, I'm lame, I can't walk, my feet don't work. Oh, no problem. Bring him over here. Here, touch this dirty apron. A dirty apron? Yeah, touch the dirty apron. You know why God did that? 
to prove it wasn't the dirty apron, it was God. And it wasn't the man, it was God. And so God used Paul through a dirty apron so that the blind could see, that the lame could walk, that the deaf could hear, that those that were full of devils and demons and lunatics could be healed. All because of what? Dirty aprons. Dirty aprons. You know what it's going to take to win uh, this world and win this city? Dirty aprons and shirts and uh, jeans and going up there and knocking on the door, get dirty and get sweaty. I'm talking about work where you're dirty, where you're got to use Ben Gay at the end of the night, all right? I mean, you can put a little Ben Gay, man, it hurts right here. I mean, right here, it hurts. I mean, you know, I've been handing out so many tracks, it hurts right here. You know what Paul did? And people got, they got healed. And people started saying, you know what, there's something special about that church. There's something special. There's something special here. But you know what it's going to take? It's going to take all of us. And the question is, you going to get in? You going to get in, Seth? You going to get in, Jeremy? Boys, you going to get in? Susie, you going to get in? Miss Connie, you going to get in? all happen. Now the question is, what are we going to do? Are we going to do something for God? Or are we just going to kick around and talk about it? It's up to us. It's up to us. Do you want God? Want God in your life? And that's what you need to pray for. God use me I want to be used. I don't want to be a regular Christian. I want to be one of them special Christians. I want to be one of them super Christians. I want to be one of them young men that does something and can do something for God. And I'm willing to pay the price. Father, we love you. I pray, God, that you'd help us Thank you for the lesson again. Lord, we love you. And I pray you'd help us in the uh, worship hour. In Jesus' precious name, amen, amen. 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 I'll take 15 minutes to get the food. Get, and get the uh, books. Are we doing another service? That's the lesson. I got that hamburger meat already cooked. She bought taco. I have hot dogs on me. Okay. Whatever you want to do. Pick out a thing and let's get to doing. Whenever you're ready. Baby. Oh, we go, Seth.